So I'm happy to introduce the next speaker to you, Valerio Maggio. He's with FBK. And yeah, please give a big welcome to Valerio. Okay, so good morning everyone, and thank you very much for coming. Um, talk today is data formats for data science. Uh, very uh, quick slide about me. I'm a, a postdoc researcher in FBK, currently in the complex data anal analytics unit. I'm interested in machine learning, text, data processing, and recently uh, with deep divergencies, with deep learning and stuff like that. I'm a fellow patronista since 2006, and I'm one of the uh, main organizers of the Pi Data Italy that I um, ask you, everyone interested here, uh, to, to check out. We have a Twitter account, and we had a couple of conferences in the last two years, one the, 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 this year in Florence, and together with, uh, yeah, together with um, PyCon Italia, it was fun. We had a lot of fun, so please check out if you're interested. Uh, another thing that's worthwhile mentioning, uh, in Langen there will be Eurosite Pi this year. Uh, it will be by the, uh, at the end of August, and uh, actually the early bit, the uh, tickets is gonna end today, actually, but it's definitely worthwhile, so if you, since you're in the uh, Pi data here, I think. Uh, it's definitely a great conference and you should definitely think to, to come. Um, and I think basically, yeah, that's it. So thank you. <laughs> Actually joking, yeah. So back to the serious part of the talk. Data formats for data science. Um, uh, the, the main goal of my talk is try to uh, point to some very interesting libraries to process data uh, in Python uh, according to different formats they may have. And moreover, let's try to, um, to see uh, what should be or could be the most Pythonic way to do that. Uh, data formats can, uh, came into play uh, in the data processing step, of course. So in that case, the question is, what's the better way to process data? And since we're here Pythonists, the, the, the better question should be, what's, uh, what's the most Pythonic way to do that? And we're gonna see some examples of that. Uh, data formats should also be involved in uh, data sharing. Uh, for instance, uh, what's the best way to share our data? And that's basically the second part of the processing so it's for the uh, presentation of data, so data visualization. And for instance, one possible way to, to answer that is uh, try to share interactive charts or, for data visualization. Um, unfortunately, we're not going into this, but I strongly, I, I strongly suggest you to, to, to follow the next talk about Bokeh, which is a very great library for that. And by the way, the very um, most common uh, to date uh, format to share data and uh, indeed data plus code plus documentation is the Jupyter Notebook. I'm quite sure that any of you here already know uh, uh, what Jupyter Notebook is, but uh, in, in case uh, you don't, please check out this very great project. So, back to the data processing. The very first example of uh, data format we're going to see here is the textual data format because it's the most common data formats we're gonna uh, work with in our uh, data processing step. And let's consider a textual file basically containing numbers. So it's a, a huge uh, sequence of numbers. And let's see what's the best way to process that type of uh, um, format in Python. Of course, the, the very simple, the, the most trivial solution for that is open the file and read the file line by line, put the, the content in, the, uh, in a list, and that's it. Uh, probably a, a more Pythonic solution should be using context managers rather than opening and closing files. That's more Pythonic, of course. Uh, and basically, we, we're what we, need. we have what we need. We, we, we store all the 
information in the files. Um, of course, this is not so efficient because we have to deal with numbers and Python lists are not very good at it. So probably a better way for do that, uh, to do that is to using NumP, of course. NumP to the rescue. And NumP uh, provides uh, out of the box a very useful function for that. So in case you have a, a textual file containing numbers that are basically uh, uh, matrices or multidimensional arrays, uh, you may leverage on the low txt function. In basically one line, you, you got what you need without uh, being uh, worried or concerned about the, the possible uh, mm, formats uh, problem you may have in your file. And uh, as output, of course, NumP, uh, low txt returns a NumP array rather than a uh, Python list, uh, which is, of course, more efficient in um, processing numbers. Uh, if, we, if we take a look at the low txt function here, uh, we see in the documentation we have uh, many, many parameters here. Uh, we may uh, specify the type of numbers we want in output, in case there are comments, uh, in case uh, we want to convert specific columns, or um, we want to specify a uh, number of dimensions for the file. Uh, that's very simple to use. There is another function in the NumP package, NumP library, which is gen from txt, and it's basically, does basically the same with the very difference that um, that function is able to load data from a textual file uh, also in case you have missing values in it. So the low txt ex uh, expects you to have a full matrix, uh, so the number of rows and columns should match. In case of GAN from txt, you have a way to specify um, a strategy to, to deal with missing values in the, in the file. Another very common textual format you may uh, uh, come across is, of course, the CSV file. The CSV file, st CSV stands for comma separated value, but in general you may have um, values in this format using different uh, characters, not only commas, for instance, tabu, tab characters, tabulations, or spaces, or a combination of that. Uh, in this particular case, we have um, a CSV file with the, uh, the very first uh, row, uh, which is the header, okay? So it keeps the information. That's quite the case when we process CSV file. Uh, so if we take a look at a very um, simple solution in Python, we have in Python, in the standard library, we have the CSV module, which is very uh, specifically um, specifically uh, devoted to process CSV files. Uh, and in this case, we open the file, we create the reader, and that's it. So basically, we iterate over the file line by line, and that's up to us to decide how to store properly the information we process in the, day, in the, in the file. Um, uh, if you're in more into the scientific, let's say, scientific system of Python, I think that the, 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 the very first solution that comes to you when you think at uh, when you think to CSV file is using pandas, of course, because pandas is very great at that. Pandas builds with um, the read CSV file. And that's very simple. Again, just one line of code. You put the the path of the file, and that's it. So in output you have a pandas data frame ready packed and ready to, to use for data processing. If we take a look again at the documentation of read CSV, we see that we have many, many options because actually when you process CSV file, you may, uh, you may come across very uh, differences in the formats and the uh, handling of uh, non-number, no, no uh, null values, uh, no number values and stuff like that. So. Um, the, in, in this particular case, the, the basic idea is we're not actually dealing with a file containing only numbers, but also uh, data of different type. So the data frame is the best way to do that. And of course, as you may see uh, in, the left, um, in, the, in the left corner here of the slide, in Pandas, you may have many, many functions um, already provided to, uh, to, to process many data formats with just one line of code. 
In particular, we say uh, read CSV, Excel, or HDF, HTML, JSON, which are some other um, formats we're gonna see in a very uh, few minutes. Let's have a, a more compli uh, let's say more complicated, actually, that's not, not so complicated example of a CSV file here. So basically the difference from the, the, the first example is that mm, here we have the first 10 lines uh, in the file that are basically metadata, not actual data. So the idea is we want to skip those lines when, you, when we get the data into the data frame. And that's very simple in, of course, in mm, pandas over, over there. You may see that we just need an additional parameter, which is skip rows. Uh, and we say how many rows we want to skip, and that's it. So again, pandas is the, the, the solution for this kind of thing. So to sum up a bit on the textual data form of the very first and simple example we saw. Uh, to be Pythonic, of course, use context managers. Uh, NumPy and pandas are the solutions if you're in data processing. Uh, NumPy mostly for numerical data uh, or data containing just numbers, and pandas for CSV. Uh, respectively, low txt and read CSV were the functions we, we saw. Um, uh, the textual data format has some uh, advantages, such, such as it's a, it is very easy to create or recreate and share, and that's very easy to process, as we saw. Um, but of course, it's not uh, so storage friendly, uh, but it is highly compressible. And um, moreover, another uh, drawback you, you may have, let's say, Another disadvantage uh, the format uh, has is that it does not support the structured information. In case we need to have some uh, hierarchy in our data, the textual data is not the proper format to use. So we come to the second example here, to the binary data format, and we start by thinking that if we think at the how much uh, space, so how much bytes we need to represent numbers, we may uh, see, for instance, integers and floats in native, in this example here, in uh, native a string representation. Um, as you can see, the, uh, while uh, the, the storage required for numbers in strings uh, increase according to the number of characters we have, of course, the numbers of bytes required for numbers stored as numbers uh, is basically constant according to the, 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 the type, of course. So the idea is uh, try to use those representation and store the data in the original format, just, uh, just like binary format. So, uh, but of course, the space is not the only concern for text, but also speed matters. Uh, so uh, when we have numbers stored as textual files, basically we lose uh, time in converting those numbers, uh, those text uh, in numbers. And, and basically that's it because uh, the conversion to int or float is not sufficient because of the underlying C function A to I or A to F. Um, the very simple way to do that in Python to store binary data is for instance using the pickle module which is imported in, uh, included in the standard library. Uh, we have an array here. So basically we have an array of 100,000, uh, 10,000, um, numbers reshaped by 10 uh, uh, in 10 times uh, 1,000. And we store that in a binary file here with a pickle dump function. So we have here uh, an array and we may load again from the binary file using pickle load. That's very simple to use. And basically it's, we don't need anything because it's standard library, so it's just Python. But of course, the problem in this case is that when we want to store binary data, it's not just numbers. Most of the time we need also metadata or some descriptions in the binary uh, format we want to, to, to leverage. So in, in that particular case, uh, the, the, the option um, is trying to think to another format, and actually there is another format, which is this so-called HDF5 format, which is hierarchical data format. It is a free and open source file format, um, and it works very great with both a big or tiny, tiny data. 
Uh, it's storage friendly because it allows you to, to have compression. That's very that's a very nice feature. Uh, and it's uh, also development friendly. Uh, it has a domain specific language to query the data in your structure basically. Uh, it has support for multiple language uh, and that means that y you may use that format uh, regardless the, the person you're showing the, the, the data you have is using Python or Java or any other language. So it's very, that's a very interesting feature. And as for Python, we have many libraries. The two, the two most famous are PyTables and H5Py. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, show you a couple of examples with both of these libraries, just to, to, to see the, the, the very difference. Um, so if you want to create a new HDF5, uh, HDF5 file, we just need to import the module H5Py and then we create a new file and we create a new data set in it. We specify the numbers of uh, elements we want. In that case, it's 100 over there. And the type, uh, so we have a new data set object in output, which is, uh, you may see uh, here at the bottom. But uh, when you have to deal with it, it's basically an NumPy array. So it's very developer friendly. Um, and we may also leverage on the slicing feature here. So we may uh, get the 10th element or slicing at step of 10. So we get basically an output an array, a NumPy array of the type we specified there. It was integer 32 bits. Uh, actually with this file format, the NumPy array is tightly integrated. If we're gonna use the other library I mentioned, PyTables, actually PyTables provides you out of the box a series of um, built-in uh, data structures for your HDF5 files, and those are uh, array, C array, E array, uh, VL array, that stands for variable length array, or table. Uh, the, the syntax is quite the same. In that particular case here, we're creating uh, in the, uh, at the bottom of the slide, we're creating a new array, NumPy array, here, and then we're creating a new table, and then we're uh, filling this table and uh, accessing it uh, through um, documentation, so it's very useful, and we append the knights here, which is the NumPy array we created before, and we specify this as, as, as a, an array of records uh, with those types over there. So it's integer as the first field and um, strings with 10 characters at most uh, for the second field. That's very useful and very easy to use. Uh, the other important feature of the HDF5 file is that we may have hierarchy and groups. So we may structure the information in our file. So basically we, may, we start from the root here and then we may create groups or, and create data sets and append those data sets to the group we created. So basically here we have a, a specific path to follow when we want to access the data in the, the uh, structure file we created in the HDF file. Um, moreover, we may also create, uh, starting from the file, we may also create a new data set directly specifying the path, and then we may access those uh, data set using directly the path uh, rather than passing by the group we created. So it's very easy to, it's very easy to use. And finally, the, the last feature I want to show you is that uh, re regards data chunking, which is very uh, useful in case you want to do in-core rather than out-of-core analytics. The basic idea is uh, when you have contiguous data sets, basically the storage here is contiguous but when you have chunks, you specify that to the, to the HDF5 file that you want to have sparse data, so you want to process by chunks, and um, that's very useful in case you want to uh, leverage those data processing in parallel. That's a feature supported, actually, by HDF5. In fact, if you wanted to show an example here, um, MPI is, uh, with the MPI 4Py library, is out of box integrated in the H5Py uh, library here. So in this particular case here in the code, 
we are modifying the file by multiple processes and we are adding to the data set, to the rank index, which is uh, an array of four times 1,000 numbers of integers, uh, these, um, we're basically uh, modifying uh, the data set with these array and we're accessing every process access each slice, each slice, each uh, specific slice of the data set in parallel. That's very nice. Uh, if you want to learn more about um, HDF5, I, I highly recommend this book and also we're gonna have another talk about HDF5 uh, more into details and that's gonna be on Friday, I guess. Yes, it's, uh, should, it's gonna be very interesting. Another, um, Binary format I want to show you is one I came across uh, very recently, uh, and it's the so-called root data format. Uh, I don't know if how many of you here already know uh, about root, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, root is um, um, a framework, a tool, and also a data format. That's why I decided to include it, uh, to include it here, and um, it, it's most of the time it um, use, uses for data processing in general, but uh, it's mostly used in physics, and especially in case you are in particle physics, that's quite the case you use uh, root for data analysis. Uh, it's a great tool, actually. It's written in C++ uh, natively, uh, but it has an extension in Python which is sometimes referred as PyRoot, uh, and by the way, root 6, which is the latest ver version of root, ships with a Jupyter kernel, so actually you may leverage Jupyter, uh, you may leverage the root functionalities within, uh, inside the Jupyter notebook. Uh, it defines, as I said, a new binary format, which is the dot root, and uh, the basic idea is it, it is based on uh, serialization of uh, C++ objects. Uh, so that's um, at a glance what root is. You have, you may leverage uh, over here, you may see you, uh, root uh, ships with an interactive shell just like the Python one, so it's very useful. Um, and you may sometimes write um, in a sort of C++ code in this interactive shell, so you basically have a sort of interactive C++, that's interesting um, from some point of view. And that's the browser, so that's the file, so here you may see a very long list of leaves in this particular file, and every time you open a leaf, which should be a, a data container, um, you see an histogram here, because um, most of the time when you open root files, you have histograms on your data, just to you know the distribution. Uh, but in case you want to go more into details and you want to extract the data from the root files, uh, it turns out that you have to write this long and boring C++ code, actually, to, to perform very uh, common operations. So basically, you have to access a tree and the leaf so the idea is that a root file, rather than talking about data sets and groups, just like, just like HDF5, it talks about trees and leaves. That's the idea, so branches and leaves. But the, 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 the general idea is just the same. That's why I decided to show you. Uh, and the other reason is that we basically here accessing uh, a tree here, and then we're, uh, that's a very weird syntax I want to show you. Actually, this is a 2D histogram we're, we're getting the data from the tree. We're uh, getting these um, um, uh, expression here. That's basically these values uh, with respect to these other values. And we're basically forwarding the output of this row to these C++ object, which is H, which is an anonymous uh, C++ histogram. And we iterate over the, the, the entries and the beans of this histogram to get the content and that's it. So we have to, uh, originally we should uh, write these very uh, awkward C++ code to do that, to extract data from this format. Uh, fortunately, we have the PyRoot as, as already mentioned and that's the uh, general syntax to do that in Python. Uh, but as you can see, the, the style, the, the programming style, uh, lacks of any uh, Pythonic feature. 
it's very C++ style, okay? So basically you have no um, naming conventions just like, just like the ones we are, um, get used in the PEP8. We're just basically, it's, it seems like we're basically writing C++ code. But fortunately, there are a couple of projects I want you uh, to show to and to point you out that are those uh, named RootPy and RootNumPy. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. They're very uh, nice projects and very easy to use. So getting these examples here using the Py root, uh, you may leverage on RootPy, and we end up writing a more Pythonic code. First of all, let's see that in case of using the get function here over the, the T file to get the, the, the tree name we want, we basically here, that, that was in the Monte Carlo in that case, uh, we may access the tree directly using the dot notation, just like a Python object, it's very nice. And moreover, another very weird thing uh, root has, when you're going to define a 2D Instagram, um, basically you have to define the Y axis with respect to the X axis, which is sort of counterintuitive. So they fixed that in the uh, RootPy project. So here, you basically specify what's most intuitively uh, expected. So X axis with respect to the Y axis. And you basically avoid those weird syntax of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, moving the output here to the this weird anonymous object by just passing an attribute here. So you said, okay, I want these row to be stored in this H2, uh, this 2D uh, histogram here, which I defined here of type F, which, which means floating point numbers instead of TH2F uh, originally defined in root. Another example using the root numpy, which is very useful, so you want to, to get the data and avoid to, to process th those files um, bin per bin in each histogram. So you just want, I want this histogram, I want this tree, and I want the, the value in it, uh, all the values in it, I want in output as in a, root, a numpy array. So that's the, 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 uh, the, the, the goal of the, the aim of the root to array function here. So we pass the file, the name of the tree, and then the branch we want, and then we get in output a numpy array. And the, 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 fun, the funny thing is that actually this library is tightly integrated in the PyRoot uh, um, ecosystem. Uh, in fact, we get these an MP array. Basically, we, we are here creating an histogram using the, the original PyRoot uh, library here. Uh, and then we're filling the, these objects using the root MP, uh function here and then we draw again the histogram using the original object. That's very nice to use. So basically you're gonna use the two libraries at the same time without worrying about the details because it's up to the libraries. And finally, another interesting feature about that, uh, root, RootPy ships with these root2 HDF5 um, command and uh, utility that's allow, that allows you to, to, to switch from the binary root format to the HDF5 format. Okay, that's it for the binary files. Uh, we're gonna see, yeah, thank you. Well, we're gonna see another, I'm gonna uh, go very quickly about this format because it's very common and I'm, I want to talk about this format more from a data processing uh, point of view rather than the, the very specific uh, reasons why, for instance, um, so far in uh, web processing, JSON is the, the format uh, of choice when you have to deal with API rather than XML. And the reasons are manifold. One of, the, one of these is that it's uh, less verbose, of course, and from the Python point of view, it's more easy to process since we're basically having to deal with dictionaries and Python lists. Uh, in case you were wondering in our context where JSON is using, uh, basically JSON is the format under the hood of the a Python notebook. So basically, a Python notebook is a JSON file. But um, for this talk, I want to, to, to talk about JSON because JSON is the format of choice for document-oriented DBs, so the, the so-called NoSQL DBs. And I want to show you a couple of slides that, uh, of a test I made uh, comparing the, uh, uh, the performances of HDF5 files uh, with versus the MongoDB. 
um, NoSQL DB. Uh, so here we, got, we are seeing that we basically had uh, one, a hundred of thousands of uh, documents here, and those documents were structured, I mean, they were textual documents. Uh, that was, so the basic idea was trying to build uh, the uh, sort of information retrieval index. So I want to store for each document all the terms and the frequencies of the terms appearing in all the documents. And more specifically, I wanted to, uh, to store the, the particular zone of the text where all the terms were gathered. So uh, it's a sort of structured index I wanted to build. Uh, so since the, these idea of structures, I j just try to, to decide if to, to, to test if HDF5 could be a possible solution. And what I got uh, was that uh, from a processing point of view, the HDF5 uh, format is not so appropriate because it takes more and more time rather than MongoDB uh, implemented in two different versions actually. So it was the flat storage rather than the compact storage. The, the differences were in the how high structure the, the JSON objects going through the, the queries in the MongoDB, uh, storing or not, uh, respectively, the, 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 the zone information explicitly in a nested object rather than <coughs> encoded in the, in the terms. Uh, so, but basically the performances were just the same. Uh, it was just a matter of how, uh, the, 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 the easiest way to deal with it, programmatically, I mean. But if we uh, look at the storage performances, uh, HDF5 with uh, these very um, simple uh, and already provided out of the box BLOSC filter, which is a compression algorithm you may leverage, uh, it's definitely the solution to, uh, to, to go for. So in case you want, um, you have storage uh, constraints, HDF5 is a great tool. Of course, uh, it's not comparable in terms of efficiency in case you have MongoDB, at least in this very tight case study. And uh, it's just, uh, of course, there are many, many things we may optimize. That's not the case of this example, of course. <coughs> For instance, the, the, the possibility to update a distributed on multiple clusters and stuff like that. Okay. Another format of interest for me for this talk was the HDFS. The HDFS is data format for big table. I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, show you a couple of slides taken from the notebook here uh, by Mark Ro uh, Rockling. Uh, it's very um, interesting to, to, to finally notice that there is a library which is called HDFS3 um, in the Python ecosystem. HDFS, of course, stands for Hadoop file system. It's the distributed version of the file system on top of, built on top of Hadoop and the data can be organized in charts and distributed among several machines. Uh, and basically it's the, fa the de facto standards for big data. Uh, in Python we have this very great library which is HDFS3. Uh, it works uh, very, um, very good on Linux machines. I had some issues um, uh, to make it working on uh, my OS X uh, machine, but on Linux it works very good. Uh, and it has a native implementation of HDFS in C++, so there is not, uh, there is no Java along the way. That's, yeah, very nice. That's the point. Uh, so the example is, let's try to see how we may leverage the analysis of, of CSV files distributed among the clusters. So here we uh, create a new file system here, over there, sorry. We create a new file system, HDF file, uh, HDFS, sorry and we ls the, this file system, we see all the, the CSV file we have here. We may read just one file here, taken from the file system, and using the read CSV file here, and put the data in the data frame. In fact, that's it. But more, more mm -hmm. and interestingly, we may um, read the CSV, all the CSV file here, uh, with a wildcard here. So basically, we're opening all the CSV files matching this query, and we're uh, accessing here uh, the, the data using this executor here, which is the, 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 the server that allows you to have the distributed computation. And the very funny thing is that basically if you execute these in the notebook, 
uh, the interactivity of the notebook is uh, still available. So basically it's not blocking. That's very nice. Uh, when the computation ends, basically you have the data you have in the data format, just like a pandas data frame. So that's very easy to use and very nice. Uh, definitely worthwhile looking at when you have to deal with HDFS. Uh, and finally, yes, we may also operate on data frame here uh, to filter the data we have and then we go, um, so we get another data frame here and we also further processing our data, that's very nice. Um, since we're dealing with big data here, another mention I would make is, uh, like to make is that is about columnar database. Uh, basically, uh, that's the, the direction in which the big data world is shifting uh, to date. Uh, so um, we're moving from the so-called row-based databases, the, the relational databases, to the columnar ones. Um, so far, there are two families, two categories, two kinds of columnar database. The group A approach, which is the Google table, HBase, uh, or Cassandra, uh, which is a, a sort of um, data model which is based on multi-dimensional mapping, uh, rather than the group B, which is the, 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 the one chosen uh, from these other tools here, which is the sort relational data model. So basically the difference is that you have data organized in columns rather than in rows. And that's very useful when you have to deal with analytics because most of the time you end up uh, analyzing data uh, going through columns rather than rows. And that's very efficient. And the, 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 the tool I want to show you is the, the, this one. It is called MonetDB. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that it basically ships with a built-in Python support. So basically, you have, uh, indeed, you have Python plus R uh, built-in support in it. So you may write inside the database Python or R code for your analytics. Uh, in fact, the MonetDB type are directly mapped to NumPy arrays. So when you have to, to process columns in your DB, they're out of the box transformed in NumPy arrays. So you leverage the NumPy processing in it. That's very nice to use. For instance, here, we are executing a query here that returns a table. That's a, a, a function in, uh, directly in, um, included inside the DB. So that's working in the DB uh, process. We are creating a new table here that has just one column of float and the language of, uh, of choice is Python, of course. And we basically creating a random array of NumPy values and we're returning the values, and that's it. So basically, we have an output on a MonoDB table. Uh, to make it uh, working and to see it um, working in a more concrete example, let's say here we have two functions here in MonoDB, and uh, here we're basically leveraging all the functions of uh, scikit-learn here. So we're basically writing Python code in it. Uh, here we have the confusion matrix for some processing, and then we have uh, more details, so more statistics on the confusion matrix. The, we're creating so a new table with all the information we want to, to plot here. We have accuracy, precision, sensitivity, specificity, and F1. We are storing all this information in a very Pythonic way here because it's Python here working in the DB, and, that, and that's it. So we return the, the, the value here. And the way we use it is just included in a query. So it's a simple SQL query here. So we select the value from the two table in a nested query, and we pass the value gathering the data from another query, and that's very easy to use. Uh, of course, it's a very quick example. Um, I highly suggest you to check out the D stock from, uh, from which of these couple of slides have been gathered. Uh, in database analytics with Python mod DB. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so that's basically the end. So the, a couple of things before uh, closing I want to show is that um, a couple of things we missed along the way, basically. Um, it's more tools rather than format, actually. And I want to, to, to point you uh, to a couple of tools very interesting uh, and very easy to use that are that now belongs to the 
PyData ecosystem, uh, those tools are the X-Array and the Blaze tool. Blaze is fantastic, and uh, it's basically a sort of one, two, one tool for all the formats. So basically, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples in the next slide. Uh, and the X-Array is a sort of extension. Is, you, you can think of it uh, as, a, as a, an intermediate way from the NumPy structure and the Pandas data frame because the X-Array is basically a labeled ND array. So the idea is I want to have a multi-dimensional ND uh, array, NumPy array, but I want to describe the, the value and the columns and the rows I have in it. So I, I want to access the, the, the rows or the columns by name rather than just by index. So that's the uh, labeled array. And it's, based, it's, a, it's a library based on the uh, so-called NetCDF format. It's um, uh, very um, uh, quite popular format in case you are in physics. And it's just based on a common data model that's called. A uh, common data model that basically uh, allows you to integrate HDF file, uh, HDFS, or other formats in a one single data format, um, and that's very useful. Um, okay, so Blaze, some guys in the, the ecosystem consider Blaze a sort of extension of NumPy, sort of, I guess, um, because it's a lot, it allows you to out of core processing, which is basically one of the limitations you have when you have to deal with NumPy. Uh, in this couple of examples taken from the documentation here, you may have you may create the data object here from Blaze, which is, which is basically talking to a database here, rather than a pandas data frame, and that's basically pr um, the same for you. Yes, <laughs> the same for you when you're dealing with the, when you're dealing with the code. Uh, in case for the X array here, you may create a data array gathering data from pandas data frame rather than a numpy array here. And basically you operate over the data uh, just like a numpy, uh, just like a numpy array. So I think that's it. So just in conclusion, I would say complicated data require complicated format. Complicated formats require very good tools, but fortunately we have Python and all the uh, PyData ecosystem for that to tackle all these problems. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Malerio. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. Next session's fine. coming up, but I'm sure Valerio will be happy to answer outside. Thank you very much. I can't be on time. I can't be. I told you.